growing weary of running from room to room, practicing one-tooth insurance-driven dentistry? Then stay tuned for the latest episode of The Lionhearted, where Dr. Steven Rasner will hand you the blueprint for what many call the gold standard of general practice dentistry. Hi, everyone. Dr. Steve Rasner here, and you are back on The Lionhearted Dental Podcast. Happy November to all my friends around the United States, Canada, and everywhere else you guys listen, particularly in Europe. Thank you, France. And I got to tell you, well, I got to tell you a couple things tonight. You're going to love the podcast because as you hear me tell you all the time, this is one of those after work podcasts, which I've been doing lately because I'm fresh. I'm actually not fresh. I'm tired, but my ideas are fresh because I actually write them down during the week and during this day as they happen. Things I think that you want to hear from me. One thing I want to tell you is that guess what's going to go soon? You ready for this? I don't know what I was thinking two years ago when I put together the idea of a podcast and I got that weird guy's voice on the intro. And you guys have been very polite. You've never brought it up to me, and thank you. You know, one goes, introducing, are you running from room to room? Blah, blah, blah. I don't know. I, I wanted to give you some, give this some pizzazz, so I hired a voice guy, and I realized this week how creepy it is. Because the podcast is killing it. I mean, by my standards, it's killing it. And, uh, you know, this is a different podcast. You have to agree. There's no other guest yet. I keep promising you guests. But so far, you're stuck with me. Um, I do, actually, by the way, I told you a couple podcasts ago. I intend to uh, get Mike Brum on here from the Strupp Brum. And Bill Strupp as well, because I think they'd be great. By the way, if I, when we do do that live Lionhearted Dentist Weekend, I am going to bring in some very special guests and a guy like Strupp and a guy like Mike Brum. They're my kind of guys. And uh, I think it'd make it for a great, great weekend. I need like one more speaker besides the three of us. They don't even know, by the way, that they're doing this for me yet, but I will inform them very shortly or ask them, plead with them to help me. I've spoken with Bill before, and I would be really thrilled to share a weekend course with uh, Mike Brum. He's top shelf guy. Look it up on Facebook. Uh, the Strupp Brum protocols, really tremendous. And you know, so this is what we're going to talk about tonight. Let me get to it because before you hang up on me, we're going to talk tonight about bad advertising versus good advertising. Before I do that, I do want to say a couple things. When I was at the recent course of Strupp Brum, and I know I brought this up recently, if you really think about everybody listening tonight, what you recommend every day, when you guys were in your operatories today and yesterday, and a patient comes in with a given clinical situation, do you understand that what you actually end up doing that day on that patient or in general in your practice is influenced by what you believe in. Now hold me there. I know that's not profound in itself, but it is if you explore it a little more. So I have to ask you, does anybody listening tonight really believe that Indirect dentistry, in other words, taking an impression or a scan and having a restoration made, whatever that restoration is. You know, everything in the restorative world has been pretty consistent in the last 10 years from my point of view. We went through a period in the 90s where we tried all kinds of different ceramics and bonded restorations and things, and a lot of them failed miserably. But it's been my experience, a lot of things in the material world have been pretty consistent in terms of outcomes in the last 10 years or so. But no matter what you use, be it Lissipress, Zirconia, K2, 
cast gold, all of it is unquestionably superior to a direct restoration you do in the mouth. And in my opinion, Steve Rasner, the lion-hearted dentist, it's also more pleasurable to do indirect dentistry. I don't know how that's very arguable. So why not then? Why don't you recommend it more? And I told you on several podcasts ago that how influenced I was by Bill, Bill Strupp, in the 90s, because I went down there and he reinvigorated my mind to the success and the reasons we should be doing gold restorations. That's what we were doing in the 90s. And I love them today, by the way, in our patients' posterior quadrants in the non-aesthetic zone. Okay? I mean, you've got to have a patient that you do one on that you could somehow fast forward 15 years to get what I am saying right now. So I was very influenced by that philosophy. I bought in. I believed that that was always going to be a better restoration than any direct composite. And way back when I started, we were, yes, we were doing amalgams sometime in the 80s. And no matter how you did the restoration, rubber dam, whatever, you're going to have a hard time convincing me that it's not more pleasurable to you to not, yeah, I get that some of you have incredible talent and can do amazing direct restorations that I don't have the patience for, but that's, I would think you would be fair and stating that it's pretty hard to beat a well-done indirect restoration that is bonded in. It, it is this. So I got to go back to what I opened this with today. So why don't you do more of them if you believe in that? Why? And I know why. Because my insurance doesn't cover that. Or I got to, you know, what my out-of-pocket will be. And I had the exact same resistance in the 90s. In the 90s. You should have tuned me out months ago, and I could almost say years ago, if you really think I'm saying this to you because you'll make more money. At the end of the day, guys, you got to tune in right now. These are one of these moments that I'm very tuned in. At the end of the day, I can't tell you how quickly your career is going to go by and how quickly even a span of five and 10 years just eclipses you. You just can't believe it. And then you're in recall. And you're looking at restos that you did. And I got to tell you, it's a very powerful feeling that you are in the right zone, the right philosophy of practice, recommending doing right by your patients. When at recall visits, they say something like it was the best money I ever spent. Or you look at them and you are proud. It's warm. It's like the opposite feeling of an implant you placed three years ago that's failing for unknown reasons. It's, if you can grab onto that, it is. It's exactly what it is. So it wasn't the intent tonight to focus on this too long. But I want you to know that one of the reasons you might be unhappy, and I try to powerfully influence you guys to have the same experience I had for really most of my whole 41 years. I know you've heard this before, but the only person stopping you is you. You have not everything. Like that's why you don't do more direct restorations. You believe in it, right? What would you do for your family? What would you do for yourself? If your 18 year old had an MOD on number 19, your choice, direct composite with all your rubber dams and special banding that they have today, tremendous, tremendous adjuncts. Or could you cut a really conservative cast gold preparation or even a zirconia or lissy press in a heartbeat? I wouldn't have to think about it. And I believe that's the case for most of you. So why not? So it comes down to what I've spent so many episodes dedicated to, and it comes down to presentation. It does. It comes down to what you say to your patients and, the, and how earnest you are in that presentation. 
So naturally, the first step, like don't, don't get all intimidated by what I'm saying that you're doing it all wrong. I, I do direct restorations also, but I don't do a lot of them. And that's just the truth. Bill Strupp, Mike Brum don't do any. I mean, that's what they said, and I kind of believe it. And so, again, I have to go back and tell you how powerful it is to believe in something. And the first thing in that belief, of course, is you have to be accomplished at the procedures. And if you're not, then take the CE. I wrote down things I told you during the week, and I, again, I want to get to the, I'll do the advertising now. The advertising mistakes that most of you make, in my opinion, are anything that implies a discount or free is a really bad approach. And so let's talk about that for a minute. I know many of you, including the guys speaking right now in my career, have caved and done those mail-out things where you mail to 5,000, 10,000 addresses at one time. And the incentive to get you for that patient to respond will be some type of implied discount, a free consultation, free x-rays, a free bleaching. And 41 years, my friends, is a long time to practice. And it's easy to become vulnerable at different times and try things. And so I'm looking at you right now and telling you that I have done all those things I just alluded to. And every single time I did it, I did it with a failed outcome. Poor patient return. Um, another thing you could do, I mean, so, so I did just the opposite. So I'm gonna take this step by step. What I did is I wanted to make my initial patient fee enough that they would value that. And I could spend the adequate time, which would be 60 to 90 minutes, depending on each individual case. I didn't have one time, I'm being honest. If today, it would always be more time than I needed. It would be 90 minutes. So I would never be rushed to do all the things that I wanted to happen in that new patient experience. And there's no amount of fee that I could charge would be enough. But the last thing I would do is create a $99 or some lower fee than the surrounding area dentist so that they would come in. When I lecture, there's a slide I use that says, free is the worst marketing word that a dentist could use or the implied thought of a lower price break. It just brings the wrong kind. Listen, I get pissed off sometimes, sorry, and just say it the way it is. The way it is is you can't be everything to everyone, so you gotta pick a road that you wanna be on. I think it's pretty clear to you guys by now, and I refer to you all the time as the lion-hearted dentist, that the road to satisfaction and self-fulfillment as the doctor of oral medicine that you are is be able to present comprehensive care approaches to your patients. Well, the best type of patient to do that to is not one that came in because you're running your stinking $99 bleaching special. And I would suggest that practices that do that probably don't adhere to a comprehensive exam. I wish some of you could video, or I would video, what a new patient week is like for me. Because I hope you know that it's exactly the way I tell you it is, that I go in and present it, present comprehensive care approach, and hopefully that will work within the scope of that patient's budget in my chair. And I'm not hesitant to say to those patients, including today, and by the way, I don't get a ton of new patient visits. I mean, eight a week would be a lot. I work four days, that would be two each day. I'm serious, I, I think it's less than that. And they don't all say yes, but they're all presented 
with a thought out, comprehensive care approach to them. And when I don't do that, I think the and and I compromise that patient's. And so if you do compromise, the question to always ask yourself is, for real, like, and this is a big comment for you, is let's say you're having a really rough first two weeks of December and somebody comes in and they need a lot of work and the treatment plan that you believe in cost in your software 24000 but they only have 14. Are we talking real tonight or what? Your treatment plan that you want to do, and when I say that, that addresses soft tissue care, occlusion, the type of restorations you think that patient needs. And it comes out to 24,000. But they, they don't have zero, and they don't even have five. They have $14,000. I'm giving you an example. What are you going to do? Sometimes you can compromise. Maybe you would do a partial denture to go with the interior full coverage restoration crowns instead of posterior implants. Maybe that would cover that extra 10 grand that they don't have. But whatever it is, you better believe you better be convicted in the fact that that will work. Cuz if it comes back and fails, it's going to haunt you. Cuz you're the one who recommended to that patient. Cuz sometimes, my friends, it's better to do nothing. And that is a refreshing liberating approach to a patient when you say, well, I say that to them. I do. I mean, the best example that I often share with you is the patient that has an atrophic mandible and they can't afford implant dentistry. They can afford a new denture for $3,000 on the mandible or maybe they can afford two implants. I never do a two implant case. Minimum I'll do is three implants. That's the minimal case I can imagine. And that's going to be a bar for me on the mandible. Three implants, a bar, some type of attachment, hater attachments or zest locators. But I'm not going to do two implants, one in B position, according to the MISH classification, one in the D position. I'm not going to do it. And it's hard to turn that down. I'm being honest with you. I'll tell you what I would do. I would do a two implant and give them the third one for free if they could afford everything but one implant. So I'm saying to you, if you compromise, you better be sure in your mind because that lesser amount that they can afford, 14000 instead of 24000 or 8000 instead of 12000 still a lot of money. The patient doesn't want to hear about that they didn't do the best plan you offered. Then, then you should have either not done anything or give them a compromise plan that you do, you can. It may not be as good as the Mercedes, but it's plenty good. You must be sure of this. If you want more information on that, we have to talk. Let's talk about real quick. I can't believe how quick this goes. So if that's bad advertising, what do I believe in? You know what I believe in? It's a lot of hard work. And I did every one of these things I'm going to tell you. Number one, we did a lot of visiting in the community. So I'm talking ways to get. For 20 of my 41 years, every single year, I visited. You're not going to like this, but some of you are new out of school. You're not sure what to do. I'm going to tell you what we did. We visited nursery schools, and I did a 20 to 30 minute spiel. I did it, and I did so many schools. I did them in the month of February. I think it's dental health month. And actually it was more than February because I did a lot of schools. I did it for a whole quarter of a year. And everything I'm about to tell you, I have in writing. We would go, I I really don't wanna break it down tonight. It was a 30 minute thing. And when I left, the child would take home a letter, literal simple one paragraph about taking care of their teeth with a toothbrush with my name on it. And there's many, many patients that I have today that I forgot that's how they started. 
I got reminded the other day by one. You get the kids' parents sometimes. Sometimes you'll get a, a teacher that's watching. I mean, we did it for so long that it'd be nothing to have six to eight teachers because they would bring in multiple classes of pre-K kids. So visiting nursery schools. I know it's not profound. Sorry, it works. I'll tell you something else that's cool to do. Sending a gift to one of your patients that you truly enjoyed working with or for their birthday or whatever. So here's the caveat. Send it to their place of work. Is that manipulative? Absolutely. It was wonderful. I forgot that I used to do that. I haven't done a lot of these things for many years, full disclosure, but I did them for a big part of my career. Another thing we did is we would send out a team on Fridays because we never work Fridays. So the team would be two people from my office with assortment of different gifts we did over the years. Um, sometimes it'd be bakery goods. Sometimes it would be a basket that somebody, I paid somebody to put together of little tchotchkes, you know, some chocolate covered pretzels, whatever you wanted to be. And we would target small businesses and it would be a five minute visit. Hey, we're from Dr. Rasner's office. We just wanted to let you know that if you ever need a good dentist, we're down the street at whatever, and she would leave some brochures. And that was face to face. I would do it again if I started today. We did seminars for one hour at 55 and over communities. I joined the Lions Club, that's a civic club for my friends in Europe, you know, I'm sure you have something analogous over there. The Rotary, the Kiwanis, the Lions Club, they're civic duty organizations. And I did it all. I joined the Better Business Bureau, Chamber of Commerce. I mean, you got to do stuff, man, to let people know that you exist. There is no magic pill. And once, and I, of course, I was open at nights in the beginning. I did. And I was open for many years till nine o'clock at night, at least one time a week. You need to know that when I sit there and I tell you that my practice does the numbers that many of you are familiar with, I mean, extraordinary numbers, that it is a cumulative outcome of a lifetime of dedication to my community that I wasn't always sure if it would pay off. And I can't remember too many times doing any of the things I just alluded to and thinking, I mean, maybe the nursery schools after many years, like I was getting sick of doing that. And I did. Then I assigned it to my hygienist. And at the end, we haven't done it, honestly, in years. Because you get to a point that you don't have to. You know, you'll get to a point where you're so inundated with business. And remember, I've talked to you in other podcasts about the key buzzwords that if I started today and I was a 30-year-old doctor, the three key buzzwords you should focus your practice around are trust and confidence. That should be the theme of everything that comes out of everybody's mouth who works for you. Why would that be a mystery or even debatable? That the patient, not we're the cheapest. You know what I say all day long that I hear myself on a new patient? Listen, I'm not the dollar store. There's a market for the dollar store, and that's not who we are. You can't have the staff I have. I use the best of the best supplies for you guys, including the equipment we have, the education we invest in our teams and myself, the labs I choose to use to fabricate the products that end up in my patient's mouths. It's just not possible to be the dollar store. So we're not that. And I've never met any patient that, that was turned off by that approach. And I've said this too before, that there's many of you listening that probably quadruple my net income by having a multiple clinics that you run and you're happy. And then if you're happy, I'm not sure why you're listening to me. This podcast for the last two years has been dedicated as a reminder to those of us that, yeah, we, we want to make a good living. 
We also want to be proud of where, what we're contributing to the profession of dentistry. Proud about that I feel like I'm giving a speech. But I'm not. I'm just on target tonight, I think. Proud of how we represent in our community. And I didn't say this to you, but if advertising is creating your brand, then part of our brand was doing community events twice a year for at least 25 to 30 years of my 41. I mean, a community event where we would take a homeless shelter. We take the parents and the kids and rent multiple buses. I mean, I don't even know what it cost me and took them 40 miles to Philadelphia to watch Walt Disney on ice or providing multiple holiday dinners and events with gifts and the dinner. I mean, and we always would go target the people that need it the most. You know, I can tell you right now, as I'm talking tonight, I'm going to tell you Steve Razzler's next target. I never did it before, but I'm going to. It's domestic abuse victims. I'm not sure, but I bet you'll hear me on this podcast tell you about at least one and several events that we're going to put together. And you know, it all comes, guys, from running your practice right. You know, you just can't do these things if you can't make your payroll, which has happened to me before. So I say that to you when I talk to you like that. I say that to you because I think it, it gives you hope that you can be on both sides of the fence in a 20, 30, or 40 year career where it wasn't always right. I've tried to impress that upon you and I'm still trying to do that right now. So if you're like thinking, right, oh my God, I can never spend a few thousand dollars to do something for my community. They know the very first thing we ever did in my community is we rented a skating rink. This is the very first thing I ever did. And we would invite the kids. That's when I worked on children. The kids that came to us and their parents. So I'd invite about, I don't know, 100 families to come and skate for free to the rink I rented and have a slice of pizza and a beverage. And the cost of admission was whatever we wanted it to be. It could be toys for tots, coats for kids, donations to the Salvation Army. And I've said this to you, and I'll leave you with this tonight. It was the most rewarding. Like, it's hard for you to feel it if you haven't done it. But when you get in that night where you go to that skating rink, or you go into a bus with your staff that's with these people you really don't know that well, or you're having a holiday dinner and all these gifts that you, so this is a lot of work that you and your team put together. You want to talk about solidifying a team. I've told you that my people have been with me an average of 20 years. It's true. Maybe that was part of it. Maybe they liked what our culture represented or what your culture represents. There's a lot to talk about with a lion-hearted dental practice that's really a lion-hearted dental practice. It's a multifaceted culture that I know you can be proud of. And it's a good, good road for you to follow. Hey, I'll see you guys next week. It's getting late, man. We're into mid-November. We got six weeks left. So if we have to set goals and start them in January, then I'm going to be here to help you do it. See you next week on the Lionhearted.